Good morning, everyone. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Welcome to worship today. I hope all of you had a special Thanksgiving this year. I am well aware, as everybody else is, that this year is very different and has been. So I hope that your holiday, your celebration um, was able to be uh, had in just the most uh, meaningful way this year as we give thanks to God for carrying us through this uh, challenging time in our lives, but also in our country and communities and our world itself. So good to be with all of you today from wherever you're coming to share in this time of worship. Here's what I want you to think about today. I want you to think about things being new. Today's the first Sunday of Advent. We'll light the, the first candle on the Advent wreath here in just a little bit as well. But this is a brand new church year with hope as the basis of our coming together. And you're gonna hear about that each week as we light each candle on the Advent wreath. Today, the theme is expected hope. Hope that is expected and out there and will come to us as we put our faith in it from, from God. So I, I hope that you'll uh, understand today is a day of, uh, of newness, the coming into a brand new year, a brand new church year. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Please know that we are going to continue our parking lot worship services at 9 o'clock through Christmas Eve. So these four Sundays of Advent and then Christmas Eve uh, will be the culmination of our parking lot worship for this year. We'll give you more information as we get further uh, toward the end of the year in terms of how we will go online with our worship. But know that there will always be this video option out there on Sunday mornings. And then know that on Christmas Eve, we will celebrate that uh, beautiful night three different times at 2 o'clock, 3.30, and 5 p.m. You can choose to come to either one of those, any one of those three worship services on Christmas Eve. You'll stay in your car just like we do now, tune your radio to 91.9, and we'll have the beautiful Christmas Eve celebration out in, out in God's world on that night. And I think it will be as memorable as any. So please have that on your calendars as we go ahead. Today we begin, as always, with confession and forgiveness, and I want you to hear now this call to, to come to God's heart, which is merciful and gracious always. Dear friends, on this first Sunday of the season of Advent, we worship as we live in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear friends, the Holy Scriptures tell us in 1 John that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please take these few moments now as a time for your own personal meditation and confession before God. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us. Renew us and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Now, hear the word of forgiveness in this cleansing of our souls for new life again now. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sin as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, dear friends, let us pray on this first Sunday of Advent. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. By your merciful protection, save us from the threatening dangers of our sins, and enlighten our walk in the way of your salvation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Today is the first Sunday of the season of Advent. We look forward to this season every year as it ushers in the joy of Christmas. It is indeed a season of looking forward, of hope, of anticipation, of expectancy. This year, the entire season of Advent is going to be based around the, the feeling and experience of hope. And today on this first Sunday, it's the experience of expected hope, of hope that we know is out there, that we expect. So I'm going to light the first candle and then we'll share words and a short prayer about this season of hope and particularly this week of expected hope.
As we light the first candle on our Advent wreath this year, this traditional wreath given by Lois Casson some years ago in memory of her husband, Alan, we give thanks for his life and faith and witness. Listen to these words about expected hope. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, creator of the universe. You call all people to wait expectantly for the arrival of your divine hope to be born so that we may be a hope-filled people with hearts full of your gracious love for our friends and family. For the night is past and the dawn of your coming is near. Let us pray, dear friends. Come, O oh, come to us, gracious God, as we wait expectantly for the arrival of your divine hope. Amen. A reading from Daniel. So the presidents and satraps conspired and came to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an interdict that whoever prays to anyone, divine or human, for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into a den of lions. Now, o king, establish the interdict and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and interdict. Although Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he continued to go to his house, which had windows in its upper room open toward Jerusalem, and to get down on his knees three times a day to pray to his God and praise him just as he had done previously. The conspirators came and found Daniel praying and seeking mercy before his God. Then they approached the king and said concerning the interdict, O king, did you not sign an interdict that anyone who prays to anyone, divine or human, within thirty days except you, O king, shall be thrown into a den of lions? The king answered, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they responded to the king, Daniel, one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king or to the interdict you have signed, but he is saying his prayers three times a day. When the king heard the charge, he was very much distressed. He was determined to save Daniel, and until the sun went down, he made every effort to rescue him. Then the conspirators came to the king and said to him, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no interdict or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king gave the command, and Daniel was brought and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you faithfully serve, deliver you. A stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of the, his lords, so that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No food was brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then, at break of day, the king got up and hurried to the den of lions. When he came near the den where Daniel was, he cried out anxiously to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you faithfully serve been able to deliver you from the lions? Daniel then said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths so that they would not hurt me because I was found blameless before him and also before you. O king, I have done no wrong. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. The king gave a command and those who had accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the den of lions, they, their children and their wives. Before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all peoples and nations of every language throughout the whole world. 
May you have abundant prosperity. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people should tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion has no end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. For he has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Luke 23, 1 through 5. Then the assembly rose as a body and brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man perverting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered, You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief, priests, and the crowds, I find no basis for an accusation against this man. But they were insistent and said, He stirs up the people by teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee, where he began even to this place. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, on this first Sunday of the season of Advent, a brand new church here, grace to you and peace from God the Father and from our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This whole season this year is about hope. Every time we light a candle on that Advent wreath in front of the pulpit here in the sanctuary, it will be a candle with a different angle of hope about it. Today, the angle is expected hope. How do we as people of God, how do we as people in this world that's so fraught with sin and challenge and suffering, but, but also the other end of the spectrum of complexity, joy and, and goodness, how is it that we have the ability, maybe even the right, we think, to have hope, to expect that hope will come, that experience in our hearts of knowing that there's an openness out there, when everything else seems closed, that there's a light at the end of every tunnel, when otherwise it doesn't seem like there's much light to hope in. God's people, we say today, should be able to expect hope. So here's where I'm going with this today. We're going to get to the focus reading in just a second, the story of Daniel, so powerful. But what I want to do before that is invite you to go to YouTube, youtube.com, Y-O-U-T-U-B-E, Dot com and search for the song Holy Now, H O L Y Now, by Peter Mayer, M A Y E R. Uh oh, that's taking me down the old Oscar Mayer. My baloney has a first name. <laughs> Sorry about that. I put that earworm now into your head. Peter Mayer, M A Y E R. Search for the song Holy Now. It's really a powerful song. I heard it years ago. Peter's a St. Paul guy, grew up here, and he sings this song about a guy coming to the realization that the faith that he's had all along, that was just kind of limited, limited to seeing faith happen in all the places that he thought he should see faith happen when he went to church and things like that, all of a sudden bursting open because the realization is that everything in the world is God's. And consequently, then, everything is holy now. Everything. And so he sees all kinds of God's work and the work of God's fingers happening all around him and everything he does. His eyes have been open and they can't be closed again anymore. So I want you to go to that song because it's pretty important in the context of this message today in the story about Daniel. Here's what I'm struck by in the story of Daniel. Every person of faith in that story, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, his friends, all show everybody else around them who are in the stories not believers in Yahweh, the God of Israel. They're believers in other 
Babylonian and Assyrian gods. The Israelites, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel show everybody else that their faith has an unshakable quality to it. That in the face of the steepest threats, Darius's threat of throwing Daniel into the lion's den and having him devoured by lions, or the king's threat of throwing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace and incinerating them, just the most wicked thing you can imagine. That in the face of threats like that, the worst, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego all expect to have hope. And when hope, when that expectation defines them, they know that their God will protect them in one way or another, and that they are living for God. They're living for God and God's way in the world, and that's their calling, and their eyes have been opened to that because everything is holy now. Even the people to whom they are witnessing about their faith and about their God. And so that's what I'm struck by in these stories today, in this story today of Daniel, that his faith is unshakable and God perseveres for him and he perseveres in his faith and hope in God who does indeed protect him and brings him out to the other side of that steepest challenge, even in a new way and even more as a new person, believing deeper and deeper in this God of grace, this, this God of salvation. That's what these stories are about. How about an analogy today? I know that a lot of us on a base level are fearful in all kinds of ways about COVID-19, about the pandemic, about the, the vulnerability of our country right now is this pandemic rages. It's like a fiery furnace that we face or a den of lions that we face. How are we going into addressing and dealing with this pandemic? What if we expected hope? What if we expected that since we've got a relationship that God has created with us, with him, why can't we access everything God promises? Healing, salvation, strength, newness, resurrection. Why shouldn't we on this Advent Sunday, looking at the challenges that life brings to us, and particularly now, expect hope in us? And why then shouldn't we expect that the way that we address this challenge, being defined by our faith, being defined by knowing we're in a relationship with God and wanting to even now strengthen that more so that we can walk into every day more acutely aware of God, more strongly attached to God, because this is who God wants us to be. Why can't our witness to the world be one? like Daniel's, of unshakable faith, of hope, of, in fact, expected hope. So I want to just tell you two quick stories today before we close. One of them has to do with a fellow named Terry Fretheim. Terry just died a week or a week and a half ago. He was a giant in the faith at Luther Seminary and a giant in a, being a teacher of the church and a teacher of pastors. I had him for a couple of courses when I was at the seminary in the late 80s. And one of the things that I remember from Terry is a lesson that he was teaching us one day as we talked about whether or not everything in life seems to be just pre-programmed by God. And that as life goes on, nothing ever changes because God's got everything preordained and it just ticks off one thing after the next, and we can't do anything about it. Of course, he rejected that. He said, life is dynamic. God is dynamic in life, too. And then here's what he said that was just 
etched on my heart and in my mind, and it has been ever since. He said, in the midst of all kinds of things in life, particularly suffering, particularly challenge, and everything that wants us to give up and give in, he said, in those places and times especially, God mediates outcomes for us and with us. God mediates outcomes for us and with us. That means that in the dynamics of life, whether it's back in Daniel's time, in the 5th or 6th century BC, or in 2020 and 2021, as we are doing battle in some cases, at least engaging with our lives in a time of a pandemic, and engaging with our emotions and our feelings and our fears, which are, are normal and natural, and engaging with all kinds of complexities that we can't control or don't have the answers to, do you know what God is doing with us and for us as we put our trust in him and as we live more deeply every day in a relationship with him? God is mediating the outcomes with us. God is helping us be part of the healing of the world. God is helping us use our minds and our brains to search out and seek out those with expertise and solutions to problems that we can be a part of. God is mediating the outcomes. And if that doesn't give us hope, I don't know what does. And then, project it out further, if that doesn't allow us to expect hope, <laughs> that the God of our salvation is alive in a resurrected Christ, the victor over sin and evil, mediating outcomes with us and for us, then there's no other place to find hope. That's the best, most, most beautiful possibility for expecting hope in the God who heals this world, saves this world, redeems us from sin, brings us out of and rescues us from all those places where we otherwise want to give in and give up. This is the story of Daniel. God is mediating the outcomes for us and with us. Thank you to Terry Fretheim for that as we remember him as his legacy lives on of faith and, and holiness. So here's my last story. It's so simple. I was in high school and I got a phone call one night. The phone rang and my mom answered and she said, Andy, it's for you. And I got on the other end and here was this voice of a woman who I knew tangentially in the neighborhood, but not a friend, not part of my friendship circle at all. And she said, Andy, this is so-and-so. I'm calling you because I'm doing something as part of a healing process in my life. And I'm just telling you right now that I forgive you for your having made me feel so small when I was younger. I didn't remember what she was talking about at all, which tells you everything you need to know about where this is going. Apparently, as a probably a junior high kid, I wasn't aware enough that I had been treating this young woman poorly. I probably made fun of her. And my eyes weren't open to that. But her coming to me in that phone call and telling me that she forgave me of that not only opened my eyes to the fact that that's what I had done as a younger kid, but that I needed to own up to that and, and ultimately allow myself to be changed by it, which I hope I did. I told her I was sorry and claimed whatever responsibility I should have for that. And now even this day in 2020, some almost 50 years later, that still is etched on my heart. 
as I look back and think about the ways that I probably treated her with all my eyes being open to everything being holy now, it makes me think even more that the ways that we treat others and walk with our own lives in the world calls us to open eyes to see that everything is holy now and that even our faith can expect in holiness hope that God is mediating the outcomes through and with us. It's a little bit like Jesus saying to Pilate, yes, you say that I'm king of the Jews. If that's what you say I am, sure, that's fine. But it's like people of faith realizing that when Jesus said that, he was saying so much more. He was saying, I'm not only the king of the Jews, I'm the king of creation. I am the savior. I'm the king of the Jews and all other people of this world. I'm the one who brings healing into their lives. When the, when the temple curtain was torn in two and when I was crucified and died for you, I died for everybody. And the, the curtain torn in two shows us that God is in the world, invading the world with grace and new life power and connection with people so that they can walk together, God and people, anybody. And it's the beauty of this realization of God's saving grace for the world that changes everything we see and how we see it. Everyone, everything is holy now. And our job is to expect hope and be defined by it. So that as we grow in our relationship with the living Christ, the one who we celebrate is coming again more deeply into our lives this Advent and Christmas. Our witness to the world is that we live for him and we live for the world God so loves and has made to be holy now. Blessings on this first Sunday of Advent as you and I together look for all kinds of different hope and first of all, expect it as God is in this world and in this life for and with us. Amen.
Please join me now as we confess our holy Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me now as we pray together. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for new beginnings. Today is a gift of this, a new church year, new eyes and ears with which to look and listen for you. Yet another gift of new faith from you today and a new awareness of the hope with which we yearn for you. Bring us into this time of expectant trust of you, that you are always faithful as our God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for all people risking their lives daily during this pandemic to help us and others and to make our lives safer. We thank you for medical personnel, essential employees, leaders who care deeply and have vision, researchers and scientists and so many others. Help us name them in our thanks and praise, O Lord, and help us know them as gifts from you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for healing, your healing of us as people and us as a world. We ask you to continue to bring healing to Diane Henning, to Shell and Betty Holt, to all who are facing COVID with both fear and hope, and all we name now silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And on this Advent day of expected hope, help us realize the power of our faith to truly expect hope from and through you, O Lord. Without you in our lives as our God, how could we ever have the possibility even of expecting to have hope, to be hopeful, to see lights at the end of every tunnel? Help this realization of faith sink deep down into us, that it would come out of us as the strongest of joyful praise of you, our God and Savior, most especially in the person of Jesus the Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, dear friends, on this first Sunday of Advent, receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you.
May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, dear friends, go in peace and hope and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God, we will. Blessings on your week. Jesus, today has come.